Please be seated. One of the benefits of this COVID-19 and the restrictions that we have is that you can't hear me singing in my head. I love the hymns that we have and I, I wish that we could be participating as we used to do in the former days, but that is not yet the case. Anyway, on behalf of the session, of the Aurelia Presbyterian Church, St. Andrews, welcome to all of those of you who are present here in the sanctuary this morning, and to those who are, are joining us through live streaming, and to those who will be connecting through YouTube. Last November, a French radio station accidentally published a batch of 100 obituaries for famous people who were still alive. Queen Elizabeth II, uh, soccer superstar Pele, Clint Eastwood were among the famous folks who woke up to discover their names listed among the prematurely dead. Radio France International blamed the mistake on a new computer system. Now, one thing that caught my eye about this story is that for Bernard Tappé, a prominent French businessman, that was the third time that a major news organization mistakenly published his obituary. Now, as of November 2020, just last year, Tappé was still very much alive. My reason for sharing that is I want you to imagine reading your own obituary three times before your death. Obviously, you're not going to read it after. <laughs> Would it cause you to re-evaluate your life just a little bit? I want you to think about that question today as we hear the scripture readings a little later on. Come, let us worship God. Come, people of God, worship the one who listens to our prayers. We will worship the one who hears us. Come, people of God, worship the one who watches over us. We will worship the one who hears us. 
Come, people of God, worship the one who offered his life for us. We will offer thanks and praise to the one who gives us life. Let us come before our Creator God in prayer. Let us bow our heads and let us pray. Living God, artist of the changes, changing skies, builder of the steadfast earth, lively Christ, born to walk life's journey with us, spirit of life, always moving in us, and among us. Your presence surrounds us here and everywhere we go. Your purpose holds the world in its place. Your imagination engages us each step of the way. Here in our time of worship, show us how we can serve you and open our imaginations to the future that you create. For we seek your guidance and your grace, now and always. God of time and eternity, we confess that we have long memories, especially for those things that hurt us, for moments we resent or regret. Week by week, we seek your forgiveness for our mistakes, but we confess we do not forgive others so faithfully. Sometimes we seek opportunity to uh, even the score. Confront us with your mercy, O God, and open our hearts to its cleansing power. Now, all of these things we pray in the name of Jesus, the one who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. From now on, St. Paul declared, we regard no one from human, a human point of view. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and everything has become new. Through Christ, God has reconciled us and given us a ministry of reconcilia reconciliation. Thanks be to God that we can all make a new start this day and every day. Amen.
The Gospel reading today is taken from the eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel, reading verses 27 through to 38. It's uh, Peter's declaration about Jesus, and then Jesus foretells his own death and resurrection. I suspect many of you are familiar with a good portion of this passage. Hear now the word of God. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and his holy angels." This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, what do I need to do to get ahead? That's the question that we ask today. Let's bow our heads once again and let us pray. Abide with us now, Heavenly Father. 
through this time of reflection. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I know these words are familiar to, to most of you, if not all of you. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. In our current culture, we have lost the understanding of dying to ourself. And that's what the cross meant to the early Christians. It was a symbol that Jesus was willing to give up everything, his power, authority, rights, safety, comfort, even his very life, to do the will of God and to restore our relationship with our creator, God. He chose to give up his own personal agenda, his own desires, his own comforts to show us how much God loves us. Jesus of Nazareth chose death to give us eternal life. And he challenges his followers to follow his example. An evangelical Christian mom had been very intentional in teaching her little boy about Jesus. And by the age of four, he was very intelligent. And the mother thought, well, he might be ready to receive Jesus as his Lord and Savior. So she asked, Benji, would you like to have Jesus in your heart? Benji just rolled his eyes and he answered, no. I don't think I want that responsibility. And if we're honest, if we're honest, I think that might be our response too. We like Jesus. Yes, okay. His teachings are inspiring. Yes, okay. His miracles are exciting. Absolutely. But do we really want Jesus to live in us? Do we really want to carry that responsibility? I wonder if it's even possible to speak to this culture, this generation, about self-denial. After all, some of us grew up in the so-called me generation. I've got to find myself, we said. I've got to do my own thing. I'm an adult, I can do what I choose to do. I will buy only the finest because I am worth it. We place so much emphasis on self, self-satisfaction, self-actualization, self-protection. How could Jesus ask us to die to ourself? What's so wrong with putting ourself first? The influence of social media has made our desire for image, wealth, and self-gratification even more difficult, more challenging. There are businesses that sell fake backdrops to make it appear on your social media site that you are living a luxurious, exciting lifestyle, even if you're just living paycheck to paycheck. A LA photo studio charges $64 an hour to rent one of their spaces that is set up to look like the interior of a private jet. Other companies sell empty boxes 
and shopping bags from high-end retailers like Tiffany or Dior or Gucci. Folks who want to get a lot of likes or followers on their social media channels buy up these empty props to use in their photos. In this way, they can project a false image of wealth and sophistication. How strange these words of Jesus sound in this context. If you would follow me, you must deny yourself. Deny yourself. How out of place, how out of touch with the reality in today's world. So let's be honest. There is a sense in which many of us have learned to deny ourselves because many times self-denial is in our own best interest. The self-help books tell us that self-denial is the path to success. If you will delay gratification, if you work hard, if you put your money into savings, if you want to have your needs met and can just uh, hold off on that a little while, well, then you can afford it, and then you will be successful. I, I think we can all recognize the level of wisdom in that advice. Gaining control over the desires that we have is the path that can lead to success. All right, here's a test. Imagine yourself being 23 years old again. Backtrack, backtrack, backtrack. For some of us, it's a long way back. But go back to age 23. You're sitting in a recliner. I'm just making this up. You're eating nachos and drinking a beer when the doorbell rings. And on your porch stand Tricia Smith and Marks Tewksbury. In case you don't recognize those names, they are members of the COC, the Canadian Olympics Committee. They tell you that they have a special computer algorithm designed to sort through the records of every Canadian to find the next great competitor in the Olympic marathon. And after analyzing hundreds of data points, the computer has picked you. The most uniquely qualified person in all of Canada to compete in the next Olympic marathon is you. What do you do? Do you kick the co Olympic Committee out and go back to your nachos and beer? Or do you throw your snacks and refreshments away, order a case of Gatorade, and set up a new training program? In an instant, you find that your focus has changed. You, cannot, you, 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 you count every calorie, every carb that you take in. You exercise for hours each and every day. You study uh, running guides, you watch training videos, you discover that your old habits now are kind of fading away and becoming just distant memories. The discipline and, and, and self-denial that were once unthinkable to you have now become your new normal. This new goal has become your new identity. Even a self Self-centered generation knows that the path to success is self-denial. But here's the catch with that. Self-denial will not bring us fulfillment if we live only for ourselves. I'm not doing this for my spouse, we say. I'm not doing this for my children. I'm, I'm doing this for me. Well, that's fine. 
It truly is. That's fine. And that may help you stay on your diet, and it might keep you at your studies, but it won't bring you fulfillment. Ultimate fulfillment comes only when we say, I'm doing this for God. Why do I say that? It's the second part of this message. There's only one path that leads to real success, and that is when we deny ourselves and take up the cross of Christ. Deny ourselves in order that we can take up the cross of Christ. The key to truly successful living is to deny ourselves in order that we might be God-filled to overflowing with God's presence and God's power. Again, as the Apostle Paul said on one occasion, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There is the path to real success. In this eighth chapter of Mark's Gospel, Jesus' teachings and miracles are drawing a crowd And in verse 34, we read these words. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Lots of people want to follow Jesus so long as he doesn't demand anything of them, so long as he kept feeding them, healing them, telling them about God's love for them. But Jesus makes it clear in this passage that his true followers are those who will follow him to the cross. Unfortunately, a lot of us want to learn about Jesus but we don't want to become him. We don't want to take that final step of denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. When we look at the cross, we can't deny our Lord's unconditional love for all of us. And there is no true love without sacrifice. So if you love him, What are you willing to sacrifice? 20 years ago yesterday, September the 11th, 2001, I was teaching at the chaplaincy school at CFB Borden when an announcement came over the loudspeakers about that attack on the Twin Towers in New York. I stopped the teaching, obviously, and we turned on the TV that was in the room, and we all watched in horror the events that were taking place. And then an order came that all personnel returned to their bases, and the chaplains all got up, headed for the doors, and took whatever uh, flights or travel that they could to get back to their bases as quickly as they could. Shortly thereafter, I heard about Father Michael Judge, the chaplain for the New York City Fire Department. He was known throughout the city for his ministries to the homeless population and to people with addictions, to AIDS patients, and and, and of course, to the New York Fire Department personnel. On September the 11th, 2001, when the terrorists attacked the World Trade Center, Father Michael Judge showed up to aid the firefighters. He was praying over the injured workers and the firefighters when debris from the collapsing building struck him in the head and killed him. Father Michael Judge denied himself. He took up his cross 
And he followed Jesus. And because he had already died to himself, he was willing to face death in bringing hope, the hope of God, to other people. No lifestyle can permanently change the world in which we live unless you and I deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. What do you have to do to succeed? Well, now you know. Amen.
Once again, let us come before our God in prayer and let us pray. Generous and gracious God, with your great mercy you have made us alive together with Christ. By your grace we are saved from sin and despair and promised hope for everlasting life with you. You have shown us immeasurable riches through your grace and mercy, and you call us now to deny ourselves and to follow Christ. We pray for those dear to us and all those we've come to lean on in these months of pandemic restrictions. We pray for those struggling in isolation or frustration We pray for all those who experience illness or pain in body, mind, or spirit. For all those who have lost someone or something central to their lives and have to cope with grief and loss. May all these, your children, know your grace and mercy. We pray for peace and safety in the world, for countries struggling to care for their citizens and to rebuild their economies. We pray for all who do not receive the respect and the consideration that they deserve. We pray for all those persecuted for their faith or for their views. We pray for all who are disenfranchised and long to live in freedom. May all these, your children, know your grace and mercy. Almighty God, we pray for your church around the world and for the congregations that we know. We pray for the work of presbyteries across Canada and the faithful ministries they lead in this time of working at a distance. For the learning we have gained in outreach during the pandemic and all who have connected to your church in new and different ways. And for ministers and other leaders who are finding this time of planning and decision making extremely stressful. May your church in all of its many expressions know your grace and mercy. We pray for the concerns that are on our hearts this day, for the fears and the frustrations that we may struggle with, for any troubled relationships, for the doubts and the hopes which compete within us, and any need for healing and support. May we, your children, know your grace and mercy. And we offer you, O God, our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. As I have done so now for a few years, I invite you to keep your eyes focused upon the cross of Christ as you go through the days that are yet before you. Just let your judgments go and live and breathe in the light of Christ and the wind of the Holy Spirit. Would you receive the benediction? And now go in peace. And may the blessings of God, our Heavenly Father and Creator, the love of Christ Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, and the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit be upon and within you and all those you love today and forevermore. Amen.